So welcome to the last practical class in discrete mathematics. And uh, let's start with discussing problem number six from um, polynomial computations assignment. Um, as there I see no people who wish to show this, I will just discuss it myself. Uh, this is important because um, we referred to this on today's lecture. When we discuss the permanent, we refer to this problem. So let us first explain all the necessary notions for that. And uh, there will be the notion of perfect matching. So uh, now we're talking only about bipartite graphs, but uh, matching are also definable in uh, arbitrary graphs. So for a bipartite graph, what do we have? We have two, say, parts, two subsets of vertices, and we know that any edge goes through uh, only connects different ones. And a matching is, uh, so a matching is uh, you take some of these edges, so that the following is not permitted. So we'll draw it, say, in yellow. So if we have, say, a vertex here and two vertices here, uh, then such situation is not permitted. You are not allowed to take uh, one uh, uh, to, to take a vertex into two edges of the matching. So the idea goes back to what they called there was a scientist called Hall, the marriage problem, that there are sort of uh, boys, girls, and would want to establish, say, marriages such that the perfect says that everyone should get married, and the matching says that, say, no one should have two wives or two husbands or something like that. So, well, but nowadays it's a bit sexist, but nevertheless. So here the perfect matching exists, and it's, say, like that. So you connect this to this, and here like that. So, of course, what is a necessary condition for a perfect matching to exist? There should be equal number of, so necessary condition that the number of vertices in V1 uh, should be the same as the number of vertices in V2, right? So, uh, otherwise you don't have a perfect match because it's exactly one-to-one -one correspondence between. So, uh, but this is not enough. So let us consider the following graph that you have two. Here you have, say, one, two, one, one, two, so say three, and they are organized like this. This is connected here, and this is connected here. This graph obviously doesn't have a perfect matching. Why? Because you have this subset here, and only one vertex here. So both of these two should be connected somehow here. And so the condition, which is called Paul's theorem, says the following condition, that if for any subset, say, M in V1, and so there is M, and this is, say, E of M. The size of E of M is greater or equal than the size of M, uh, then there exists a perfect matching. Okay, so this is a necessary condition. It's actually if and only if, because if a perfect matching exists, then it should uh, satisfy this stuff. If uh, it satisfies, then it, because otherwise, if this, this set is smaller than that one, so here is M, then uh, this is just pigeonhole problem. There are not, not so many people here to satisfy all people here. Okay, so this condition, by the way, is not so easily checkable. Check this, you will need an exponential time algorithm because you will need to uh, try all the subsets of the graph, of the left, say, zone of the graph. 
and this is exponential, two to the power. But there is a good algorithm. So let's try it. The algorithm actually will work like that. It's called augmentation, again augmentation, like an Euler cycle. Augmentation of a matching. So, okay, suppose we have some matching. Well, we can start with the empty one. An empty one, of course, always exists. So the matching here is going to be like, I don't know. So here are some vertices. Here are some other vertices. And suppose there is a matching which somehow matches them. But here you will have a vertex which is denoted by red, we denoted by x0. So x0 is not matched. And here are other vertices which are matched. So possibly somewhere, somewhere here there is a vertex which is also not matched. But these vertices here, they are matched. And then I claim that we can extend this matching. We can, well, it's not augmentation uh, actually like in Euler cycle. We will not extend this very matching. So what is the problem? Okay, if there is x0, which is not matched, and we know that, well, our prerequisite is that the size of the left zone is the same as the size of the right zone. And of course, we'll have some, so we have other edges. We can say have this one, we can have this one, we can have something like that, like that. But here, we cannot just take any vertex here and say, okay, we'll link x0 to this, say, y0 because they could be not connected, right? But let's do the following. Um, let's just uh, start with uh, some easy things. So uh, this x0 is not matched. And what are the two possible situations? So the first possible situation, which is easy, which is trivial, that x, let me draw it in a small here, that x0 is connected to some other vertex here, x1. And this x1 is not covered by the matching. So the matching is uh, somewhere outside, somewhere here. What will happen now? We can just add this edge to the match, and we're fine, right? Okay. So the interesting part happens that x0 is connected to something, but this one which is connected to this vertex is already connected by an, so it's already inside the match. So in this uh, case, we cannot just add this edge on top to the matching because this will violate the laws. And therefore, we are going to con con construct the, uh, build the construction which is called augmentation path. So the augmentation path works as follows. It starts with x0, then it takes this guy, if this guy is connected by a matching to something, then it also takes the one which, which connects here. Then suppose that it also goes like this, for example, and say like, I don't know, like this, suppose the graph is as follows. So the, the, these guys will be like that. So this is x0, y1, x1, so let's y0, x1, then say it goes, Back here, it's going to be y2. Then it has to go back by this yellow edge, and it's going to be x3. And then finally, it reaches this point, which will denote by y3, and this is free. So how does the augmentation path work? It goes forward along lines which are not in the 
in, in the matching or arbitrary lines, but backwards it only takes the yellow lines. So it goes forward, backwards, forward, backwards, forward, and finally it reaches a free vertex. Why should it reach a free vertex? Because otherwise, if suppose that there is no, we have exhausted all the stuff here and we, we can, haven't reached the free vertex, then we we'll violate the uh, condition of Hall's theorem. We'll have uh, on the on the on the left hand side we will have say too many vertices which are which are not connected to. Okay, so if the augmentation path fails, then we we see that there is no perfect matching because the whole theorem condition fails. But if there is a free vertex, we can along the augmentation path we can rec redraw it. So, by the way, the backwards paths, they are always not yellow, because otherwise we get violation of our conditions. So back here we go, so uh, forward is black, backwards is yellow. And if we fail to find an arrow, which, then we just see that there is no, the no say possible. Uh, the, the, these axes, they have no possible connection. And we find the first three of them. So. So that we don't have the backward. Okay, so in the augmentation path, we just redraw. So I'll redraw it in I don't know, to to to, to few colors with with green. So this will be our new matchings. Here, this will be made black. This will be made black, and uh, backwards and forwards. So you see here we had. So okay, let me draw it just as a. So we had x0, black to y0, then we had yellow, so it was in our uh, path, in our matching, we back to uh, x1, then back to y1, uh, then uh, back to go forward, we went to x3, and then this led us, by black it led us to y3 right and then we make we flip them so we make these one these ones we make them yellow and uh, these ones we make them black so you see that what happened now so if there were some edges in the perfect in the matching which were not covered by that they are just just intact we don't make anything do anything in this augmentation path, now there are, it's, it's of odd length always. And there is, there is one more edge of the matching. And so we served this starting vertex x0. So now the number of edges in the perfect matching is greater by one. And this process can be performed until we arrive at a perfect matching, or at some point we see a violation of our uh, of the uh, law of construction of this guy. Okay. So, any uh, questions, uh, comments of this time? Why one? Um, oh, yeah. It's uh, it's um, yet. Yeah, let me see it here. I think I. Yes. Yeah, so this is yes. Yeah, so this is why one. There's no y zero. Yes, sorry, it's just I. Oh no no no. no sorry 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 stop stop. Yes, it's, we have to find y one. X zero y zero x one. So this is y one actually. This is y one. Then you will get yes, and this will be x two y two. Yes, x two and y two. So thank you. Yes, and the y two is already three. What? Of the main idea. So, okay, we start with an empty matching. So then we just, okay, if the matching is empty, we, we just take any vertex. It should be connected to something. Otherwise, there's no matching, of course. Not the matching. We'll just take it in the matching. Then, so then we do pro proceed by induction. So at uh, each point, we have uh, 
uh, at each point, how can you say this? We have uh, we have a matching. This matching is not perfect because the number. So in the perfect matching, the number of edges should be the same as the number of uh, vertices in one of the halves of the graph, right? So suppose what does it mean that the matching is not perfect? It means that say in the left half of the graph there is a vertex. Let's call it x zero. The left x zero x is on the left. So x zero, uh, which is not inside the matching, so there is no yellow edge coming from it. And we start this path. We connect x zero to something. If that is not in the matching, we just add this edge. If it is, we take the edge backwards. Then we go forward, backward, forward, backward. And if this process fails, if we don't have to move where to move, then actually the perfect matching does not exist because this whole condition gets violated. Um, and if it, if, if it succeeds, then uh, so if it fails, then we say fail, nothing happened. But if it succeeds, then we perform the following. We take this augmentation path from x0 to y0, back to x1, forward to y1, back to x2, forward to y2. And this path is as follows. So the backward links from y to x are inside the matching, and the other one are outside, right? And then we just flip. So we take these ones as inside the matching, and this to remove from the matching. And it's easy to check that it's still a matching. And inside this matching, uh, we have one more edge. And this process allows us inductively to construct the perfect match. And at today's lecture, I showed how it is connected to the problem of permanent. OK, any questions on Teams? So if not, um, then I will show you the final task for today. So for people in the room, they can just take this from this is here. And for other ones, uh, I will show it on the screen. It's called Graph Colorings, and I will copy the link to the chat, and also it will be in the description of the video for those who are watching it. Um, yeah, so it's called graph color. I hope you all see it in some form. So some of the stuff here is just recalling uh, what happens. And uh, the other one is new. So we'll prove how to improve and pick hardness of uh, three color. So let's start with the first one. So actually, we already did this. Uh, let some of you just recall how is it solved. So two coloring, how to solve it is polynomially decidable. We even did two ways of that. So how do you show that uh, you can you ask whether a graph is colorable in two colors? OK. Greedy algorithm, yes. Here it says the correct thing, that you can just start coloring your graph in two colors. And what are the possibilities? Either you just at some point reach the correct coloring. So yeah, recall that uh, edges and vertices should be covered differently. And this means that the graph is bipartite. Or you find that you have a conflict, that you start coloring, and at some point you want to color the same vertex in different colors. This means that in your graph you have an odd cycle, and this graph is not too colorable, it's not bipartite. OK. So now let's think about problem number two. This is more a problem for you. So what is a graph which is k colorable but not k minus one colorable? Yes, exactly. It's a full or complete graph which is denoted by uh, uh, kn, or here it should be k uh, k. So suppose you have a graph in which all the vertices are connected. How much colors do you need to color the graph with respecting this property? Of course, the number of the vertices, because all of them are connected. And for each k, you have such a graph which is not k colorable. So something more interesting. So if a graph is k colorable but not k minus 1 colorable, why its number of edges should be at least the following one? By the way, what is this number of edges? It's number of edges of a complete graph, right? Why should that be true? OK, so let me write this down here. So 
so a graph is not what does the k minus one colorable then the number of edges is greater or equal than uh, k k minus one divided by two So how do we prove this? So for example, if the graph is not bipartite, this means it's not too colorable. Now what is the minimal number of edges of a non-bipartite graph? Or three, right? Because it's a triangle. If you have two edges, it's always bipartite because they are either they're independent or they are like this. But so here, how do you prove this? That if a graph is not colorable in k minus one colors, then it has at least. So it's not not k minus one. It means that it should it it requires at least k colors to be colored, right? So. Uh, Suppose it's colored in K color. Suppose it's K color. I think it's here, yeah. Yeah, but it's K, it's K colorable. So it's K colorable. And we can see that it's, what is K color? K partite, right? So there are K parts, these big parts, and no edges come inside this part because they're vert vertices of the same color. So say this is blue part, this is green part, Say this is red part, and this is white. Okay. So what happens next? Next we um, connect. So okay, we have to. The crucial idea is the following: we have to connect each pair of the each each pair of compo of the components. If this part. So if we have to have one vertex here, one vertex here to connect like this, also somehow like this, they could be different, but nevertheless, and so on. So this should be for any pair. So actually, we should have like something like this. Why should this happen? Why should we have such connections? So we know that the graph is not k minus one colorable, but it's k colorable. Wow. Yes, because if some some two groups are not connected, then we can color them in the same color, right? So then we k minus one colorable, and this number of edges is exactly k k minus one divided by two. So if we see these parts as a big vertices, this is going to be the complete graph, the full graph. So this is how this is solved. So these are two. Uh, to do things like that. Okay. So, and finally, problem number three. Problem number three says that uh, k color, the problem of k colorability of a graph, belongs to the NP class for any k. So, what does this mean? Well. How can you solve this? What does it mean that it belongs to NP? There are two definitions. What is it? at least one of them? Okay. So, well, if no one wants to answer, then I will answer. So, it's also, it's, it's, it, these are the first, all the first, uh, well, not for one, two, three. They are easy. They say not something which should be problematic. Uh, what it says here is just that, um, uh, well, you can non deterministically guess the coloring, for example. Or you can, uh, uh, take it as a hint in the sense of second definition. So it's just standard definition of NP. And for problem number four, let me, uh, open it in another way so I can draw on it. Just one moment. 
Do you mean in, in, po in point three? Uh, no, we can say, that, OK, we just guess the correct coloring. And we're fine. It's, it's non deterministically polynomial. So we have angelic choice. It means that we in our NP algorithm, we just non deterministically guess the result. OK, so uh, any more questions about NP? Well, what is NP? Again, there's a basic definition of this course that uh, a problem belongs to NP. If we can uh, make correct, so the following hope that the answer is yes, if we can make correct guesses to make it true. So here, if we say I will guess the coloring, if the coloring exists, I will guess. It's not deterministic. It's, it's, so it's sort of an, another programmistic say, philosophy that you do not program things like you wish to find something. You can just say, I will guess it. Of course, this can boil out into an exponential algorithm. We'll just try brute force search. But here's NP. OK. So let's consider the following fragment of a graph. And it's partially colored. So these vertices are red, green, blue. And also we have these guys. So let a Boolean, so we have Boolean ones, right? so we have X is true, is the same as X is green. So green is true, false is red, and blue is the third color. It doesn't mean anything. The same for Y. So let's write down a Boolean formula, which is true if and only if the remaining three white vertices can be correctly colored so that D becomes green. How can we do this? So we want D to be green. How can we make it green? So you see that the coloring should be correct. And therefore, um, therefore, we are, uh, what are, should be the colors of these two vertices which are adjacent to this D? So, yeah, this is D. We have overcolored it but let me make it d so it should be green but it's still d yes they should be colored in different colors so they sh they should be colored in uh, blue and green and red. Oh, sorry. So this say for example this is going to be blue and this is going to be red. So what can you then say about these two vertices x and y? So you see that at least one of these should be red, right? So this was a gadget, we call this gadget. Well, this is just a, an informal thing. Uh, for two things, so this modeled not X or Y, and it said that if at least one of these guys is green, then this can be made green, right? So now, how do we make a gadget for three? So this not Z should also go somewhere and somehow connect to the gadget. How can we redraw it? Well, one of the ideas of this course is as follows. If you don't know what to do, then uh, reduce your problem to something where you know what to do. 
We know how to construct a disjunction of two. Now we need to construct a disjunction of three. We have a good thing which is called bracket. Does this make sense? Does this give you any hint? So what do you have? Here you have just not Z. So this is this vertex here, right? And where is a vertex for this one? We already did that in the original formula. No, no. What is the vertex which represents the truth of X is D? And what should we do to connect it by disjunction with not Z? This one, right? Not, not Z. Okay, let me let me just draw it then. So I think the idea is fine, but let me do it. We draw another gadget here, another triangle, and connect it like that. So this is going to be our new D prime, which is the new D which is representing exactly this. So this is colorable in green, exactly if this, because how can it be colorable? Again, these two, they are this, this one and this one. They are red and uh, blue. One of which is red, the other is blue. This determines the choice of which of these two should be green. So either this is green, this means that not Z is true, or this is green, that means that D should be true. And then we descend lower. Okay. So what happened? We made this vertex on, on here, we made it colorable in green, if and only if the original, uh, the, this uh, clause was satisfied. So now what, what can we do? What is the, let, let's see what's the next problem we're supposed to answer. We need to construct a graph which is three colorable only if the formula is satisfiable. So first, how do we force, so it should be satisfied, so how do we force this uh, D prime to be green? How can we force a vertex to be green? Yeah, so it should be connected to the blue and red vertex. And we just connect it to the vertex which is known to be blue, so to this one, right? And to this red one. After making these connections, we force this one to be green. And this means that this should be satisfied. And then we do the same. So this will be, say, uh, sorry, this is, say, D, D1, which corresponds to this, right? So suppose we have something else. So I don't know, X or not y or not z then we do the same trick and i will do it in gray just so here will be a vertex d2 which is again connected to the same r and b and d. so it should be connected again so this should be one gadget here connected to here this should be another gadget here and this will connect in a different way x or not Y. And this is also connected to B and to, to R. So this is forced to be green. And so on and so forth. So this is encoded by D2 and for all the clauses in our three series. Oh, a big graph. And this graph is going to be colored in three colors. If and don't, so this big graph, the whole one. Let's denote by G5, where phi is our CNA. 
our conjunctive normal form formula. So is it clear how we construct this graph? Repeat, right? So we start with our we start with one pair of gadgets. So we for first. So there are several same things. First, we have this what is called palette. We have this triangle of RGB. Then for each variable, we have a pair of vertices which are connected to B and connected with each other. So this means that one of them is green, the other is red. These represent the truth for uh, a particular uh, variable. So for each variable, there are two literals and it, either one literal is true, the other is false, or vice versa. So it's uh, uh, determined. So this is about the variables. So here we have three variables, we have three pairs, six vertices. Now we uh, take care of the clauses of the CNF. The clause of a CNF is a disjunction of three uh, elements, literals. So how do we simulate that? For example, this is D1, which corresponds to not X or Y or not Z. We take two gadgets. So the first gadget takes not X or Y, so it's this is a small triangle, which is connected to not X and Y. And this vertex of this triangle is forced to be a green. So it could be made green if and only if this disjunction is true, right? Next, we add not Z. Again, we construct a small gadget here. And this gadget with the vertex D1, again, D1 can be colored in green, if and only if either Z is green or at least or this D is green. And D is green if either Y or not X is green. So you see that D1 is colored in green if and only if colorable in green. If and only if uh, this uh, clause is satisfied. Now, and this of course makes the graph absolutely a mess. We <coughs> have to do this with all the clauses of our CNF. So, for example, we have another clause. Again, we have to do the, the, these two gadgets and get another one. So, is this clear? How do we construct these special vertices for representing clauses? Here on Teams. For each clause. For each clause. In the, in the, the, these clauses are in the big conjunction, right? this list of clauses. For each clause CI, we have this uh, DI, which is the vertex, which should be made green. And now, how do we force these vertices to be green? We just connect them to the palette. We connect them to B and G, uh, to B and R. So if each vertex DI is connected to B and R, it could not be blue, it could not be red, it should be green. And so they're all colored in green, and therefore the CNF should be satisfiable. So it should be satisfied by the given satisfying assignment, how these vertices X, Y, Z are connected. Are covered. Conditions. Yeah, well, do you mean by condition that uh, uh, connected vertices should be of yeah, different? Connected. Yeah, but oh, if we drop this condition, if we remove it, then any graph is colorable, trivially. You just color everything in red and... No, I... Uh, we don't connect the... Yeah, then, yeah, then it could be arbitrary color, of course. So then it will just represent... So. D1 could be green, which means that this uh, is satisfied. But we also could color it red, which will represent that it's not satisfied. Or we could color it even blue and say, well, I don't care. So the idea is that we should force the eyes to all, all the eyes to be true. So all the eyes to be green, which means that the corresponding disjunction, the corresponding CNF clauses are uh, satisfied. So this is important, right? Uh, the same as the number of clauses in the CNF. 
for each clause here it's written yep so each clause of this so this is clause yes no but why no why given the formula though cnf is given it's fine given a formula we construct a graph yes yes so now there are people who are asking now do we ask something else why connect d1 to the initial palette if we draw the additional gadget no no we connect uh no we connect this d1 but would not connect this original d which is here this d is not connected because this d by the way is not required to be green may be not green so this happens in the case when we satisfy this by not z Uh, to make d1 green yeah so uh do you, so the, the trick is as follows d1 is uh greenable in the sense that it could be colored in green if we can satisfy the corresponding clause but uh how do we force it to be green uh, force the clause to be satisfied the, to, to force it to be green we have to uh connect it to the palette this is the uh, why should we should connect it. I hope that I answered the question. In some, in the, yes. But D, this uh, intermediate thing, which corresponds to part of a clause, it uh, is not required to be green because the part of a clause can be false. It's okay for the part of a clause to be false because the clause is a disjunction and we can make it, uh, uh, we can satisfy it using a different part. Okay, so now this big graph, it's colored in some colors, and uh, this represents the satisfiability of the reseller. Okay, there is some problem, and let's uh, think about it. In this, when we started with 4a, we uh, saw that here it was this thing that it was partially colored. So we started with a graph which was all, had already three vertices of given color. And then we did all the stuff. So this, uh, we, what we did, we said, okay, we'll draw and draw and construct the graph. And this will mean that these DIs, they will be possibly colored in other colors if uh, there are, uh, so they could be possibly colored in other colors if there are, uh, corresponding clauses are satisfied. So first we color these Z's, these variables, then we color these guys, and then force them to be green and say, okay, this can be colored um, properly if we don't leave the CNF is satisfiable, right? But we started with already given three colors. The palette was already colored a priori, but in the real world, it's not the case. So we would start just with the graph. How do we solve this? So suppose this palette is colored in a different way. It's possible. How to cope with that? No, no, we are on the other side now. So the problem is as follows. So if our CNF is satisfiable, then starting with this color of the palette, we can color everything correctly, right? And the DIs will be green. If our CNF is not satisfiable, then starting with this color of the palette, we can we cannot color the remaining graph correctly, right? But suppose that our CNF is satisfiable is not satisfiable, and we start coloring this graph, but color the palette in a different way. Maybe then we could uh, color everything correctly. So we are not given the coloring, the initial coloring of the palette. The graph is just colorless in the beginning. And then it evolves into adding new and new. How do you think to cope with that? The formula is not satisfiable. And but suppose 
if, if the formula is not satisfiable, we need to prove that this graph is not colorable, not only with this palette colored properly, but with any sort of color. It's an easy question, by the way, but it's the last part for us before we show that uh, three set is uh, three color is in fact. So suppose we instead of coloring this say green, we color this red, that this green. What will happen with the coloring of the? They will no, not be green anymore. But actually, what we can t tell about the palette, uh, even if we don't have this pre-coloring, the palette is a triangle, right? So what does this mean? So it means that it it, the color should be different, right? But then, it's exactly three colors. So this means that actually, well, nobody has told us that uh, which is red, which is green, and which is blue. And the idea is as follows. So suppose we have some coloring of the graph in three colors, and then we just declare that the color of the first vertex of the palette is green, the color of the second is red, the color of the third is blue. We can always do this because the colors, well, they have equal rights. No, we're not guessing, we're just, so we're, we're given a coloring, so we're now going vice versa. Suppose the graph is colored, and we want to show that the formula is satisfiable, right? This is what, the direction which was problematic. So graph G is colored, this means that it's, uh, it has a palette. And now let's rename the colors. It's colored somehow, but we say, okay, the left vertex of the palette is called green, and this color is green, the right is called red, and the lower is blue. We just declare them and so on. And then this yields that these GIs should be green in the new sense. And then this means everything else. It means that the problem is satisfied. Okay. And the goal of this thing is as follows. That three color is NT complete. Why? Well, because we know that for C, let me write it once more. So we have a formula phi, and this formula phi is so this is a, the phi is the three CNF. It's translated into G phi such that phi is satisfiable if and only if G phi is three colorable. And so this gives us actually a reduction. What is this reduction? What does it reduce to what? No, vice versa. It reduces sat to colorability. So it reduces three sat. So it's polynomial. Any one reduction to three color. So, by the way, about reducing three colorability to three set, we had it already. So, it's a vice versa. Uh, if you want to reduce three color to three set, you just take a graph and construct a Boolean formula which expresses the fact that it is three colored. And you remember that, that you said in, in your homework too, it was 0.7 like that. So, for each vertex, we had three variables and said that at least one of them should be true, only one should be true. Here it's more interesting. We reduce uh, a Boolean problem to three colorability. And since this Boolean problem is NP hard, or NP complete actually, then this makes this problem also NP hard. Because it's not easier than reset. So we encoded something Boolean in uh, the world of. Uh, this coloring thing. So two color is polynomially solvable, and it's equivalent to two set. And three color is uh, NP hard. So this is gap from two to three is shown as follows, and this uh, finalizes the proof of point D. 
By the way, unfortunately, the reduction is not parsimonious, so for counting problems, you should invent something else. Because here there are many. Uh, so the problem is with the gadget. So here, if both these cyan uh, vertices are green, then you could flip this one. You could replace them. And the counting will be jeopardized. But the polynomial time, many to one reduction is here. And well, uh, formally, we didn't prove that it is polynomial. But uh, well, let's just analyze what we are doing. So how many vertices, for example, are there in the new graph? So the number of vertices, well, what types of vertices do we have? So for first, we have the palette, so it's three vertices, right? Then for each variable, so suppose we have k variables and n clauses. So how many vertices do we add for each variable? For example, for x, two, yeah. x and not x. So the number of vertices is three, it's the palette plus uh, 2k. And for each clause, how many vertices do we add? It's a bit more tricky. For each clause, yeah. We add two gadgets, right? And to, uh, each gadget is how many vertices? Well, here, okay, well, well, this is the gadget. So this is one gadget, this is another gadget. And this, these two, they serve for this clause, right? How many vertices are here? Six here, two gadgets, two, six vertices, so six and. So the size of the graph is polynomial, right? Formally speaking, we should also uh, show that uh, constructing this graph is polynomial, but again, this is obvious. Because each time, say, we add these two vertices for, so first we start with the palette, the three vertices, we draw the edges. Then we take, say, for x, we take two vertices. Again, we draw three edges. This is also polynomial. We do so for each uh, variable. And then each gadget, again, we just put purely constructive. We say we add these six vertices, we know how to connect them. So all polynomial, polynomial time doable. This is important because this function so this is the reducing function f, which takes phi and gives g phi. And this reduction should be performed in polynomial time. Otherwise, it's not polynomial reduction. OK, so uh, now this is all the yeah, polynomial time. Doable. So the problem could arise if there were some edges for which we do not know how to connect them. So here's purely constructive. We just declare that I want these vertices with these edges. We do not solve any problems to understand whether we need such an edge or not. Therefore, this for function f is polynomial to time computable. And this gives us this polynomial, indeed polynomial reduction. So we have, in the, uh, today's class, we have seen another uh, NP hard, NP complete problem, which is the problem of three coloring. Okay, I stopped sharing the slides by now. And uh, now question for all the people. So we, at this point, the course actually ends. And uh, the question for you, uh, whether you have any questions, comments on the course, or something like that. Yeah, can we obtain uh, themes that uh, would be included in the exam? Yeah, for the exam, I would like to just, so the themes will be all the themes which are were presented at lectures and practical classes. And in order to get some idea of how uh, the exam will, uh, of what things will consist, just I will show one thing. So at the course's webpage, as you can see it here, 
the course of the web page, you can go lower and see this old data for 2020. He will have a, the final exam. Oh, okay. So, uh, of course, this will be not the exam which you will take for your final exam, but the uh, basically the thematics of the problems will be closed. Okay. Yes. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. More questions? Well, if not, then I would like just to thank you for being with us for this course. So this course is for one module. So after the finals, you will be the full stop for this course. No a formal continuation of this one. Good luck with your studies and hope to see you somewhere in the future. Um, thanks a lot. This course was great. Uh, Thank you. Yep. So the uh, yeah the final exam. You answer to Mohammed Safian. Uh, the uh, final exam uh, will be not that task which is published as for final 2020. So final 2020, just an example. The uh, exam will be published, as I said on today's lecture, on uh, Tuesday. Yes, in the uh, it's afternoon, and the deadline will be Wednesday also in the afternoon. All the stuff will be published. Okay, so full stop. Thank you and goodbye.